Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. And uh, I think this Lily Joe Centre is a really good uh, initiative. So thanks for kind of organising that and setting it up. It's really nice to speak to people beyond, you know, computational biophysics, speak to material scientists, people, quantum people, and the like. So today I'm going to introduce molecular dynamics and uh, differential molecular simulation. Uh, I'm going to describe some previous work to learn a coarse grain force field for proteins uh, from scratch. I'm going to outline some challenges in applying uh, differential simulation to larger biomolecular systems and then describe some recent progress um, on implicit solvent. Okay, so I think most of this audience has probably heard of molecular dynamics, was vaguely familiar with it. Uh, my background is, is more biology, and I think it's fair to say that uh, physical systems and biological, sorry, physical simulations of biological systems have really helped us uh, to understand biological processes. And these methods are work best when used in combination with experimental data. So, for instance, um, giving mechanistic understanding that experimental uh, approaches can can identify, or even um, pointing to new experimental directions. And ever improving compute resources, uh, new machine learning approaches, and better protein structure prediction um, with AlphaFold mean that simulating biomolecules with molecular dynamics is just going to become kind of more and more, uh, more and more important. But there are problems with the molecular dynamics, and I think you can split them into two broad categories. Um, the first is the sampling problem. So most biological processes happen on uh, the millisecond time scale, second, or even you know, years when it comes to something like protein aggregation. But when you simulate uh, on kind of commercial hardware, you can only get to about uh, microsecond, millisecond, perhaps uh, routinely. So, so there's a clear problem there. Uh, the second problem, which is the one I'm more interested in, is the force field problem. So that's the actual rules by which the molecules move. And that itself uh, falls into two, two categories. So do you have the correct functional form? Um, for instance, quantum mechanics or electrical mechanics, or you could start to combine atoms and have a coarse grain force field. But also correct parameters. So over many years, we've selected the hundreds, perhaps even thousands of parameters in force fields um, to do certain things, namely to keep folded proteins folded. And now we're starting to realize that when it comes to uh, disorder proteins, um, they don't work so well. And uh, if you want to um, you know, dock a ligand into a protein, you need to then parameterize the ligand as well. And these two problems are actually related because uh, you can't judge when you have the correct functional form unless it's well parameterized. So how do you parameterize a force field? Well, normally you choose a functional form. You kind of guess the parameters either from an existing force field or some physical intuition. Uh, you'd run some simulations and you change the parameters to match um, experimental or quantum mechanical data. Now, this is good because it, it works. It's how we've got force fields so far, uh, but it's an awful lot of effort, and you can only change uh, a few parameters at a time uh, in general. And then there is what you might call the modern approach completely the other way. Uh, you just train a big neural network to do everything. Um, you train it on trajectory data, for instance, to reproduce forces. Um, all it takes in is coordinates and atom labels. And this is nice in the sense that it can learn anything. Um, neural networks are universal approximators. But we do struggle with a lack of data here. Um, the network you get out isn't particularly interpretable. And neural networks actually run slower than um, a molecular mechanics force field. So you, you might end up needing to jump time steps in order to make this worthwhile. So it's, it's questionable whether this is the right way. So I'm promoting a kind of a third way, um, differential molecular simulation. So this is kind of a best of both of the two. Um, you choose the functional form and uh, then you, you run your simulations in an automatic differentiation framework, which I'll describe. And then that allows you to change the parameters to reduce uh, some loss function. And so this has the advantage that you can change all parameters at once, um, but you retain the interpretability because you're using a, a standard functional form. But it does have the downside that it takes a long time to train. So um, for those of you familiar with, with neural networks, think of a recurrent neural network. You would have a series of inputs. And then your, your kind of your weights and biases would act on that through a series of hidden states, uh, and you get an output which will be compared to your true output. You'd obtain a loss function, and because you've implemented this in a in a system like PyTorch or TensorFlow, um, 
you can you can just press a button and it will it will run the tape for you it will track your gradients using automatic differentiation and it will give you the gradient of your loss with respect to the parameters and that's how you train neural networks and really differentiable simulation is an analogous idea here you have your starting coordinates you have a trajectory and then you have your final coordinates and then you calculate some loss for instance the root mean square displacement to a, a native structure and then you do exactly the same thing you get the gradients of that loss with respect to the parameters of the force field and so you can imagine that epoch zero if your potential is flat um, your atoms will just fly off into space according to their starting velocity and then over a few epochs uh, if your training is to keep to stabilize native structures it will have to learn a potential to, to keep the, the atoms where they are and you hope that potential is kind of physically meaningful now more broadly this links into the concept of differentiable programming so neural networks are great they're used everywhere all the time now but they're black box models they're hard to interpret but in science we often know something about the system and so recently the field of deep learning is kind of broadening to, to include this concept of differential programming, where you calculate gradients through arbitrary scientific models. So for instance, you might have a differential equation where you know a form and you might have a part of it, which is you don't know, so that's a neural network, and then another part is known. Uh, and you can link that all together with these, with these uh, automatic differential frameworks. And really it's been allowed by advances in hardware, particularly GPUs and software, um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAPS, et cetera. So, Who's tried to do this before with, with molecular simulation? Well, there was um, John Ingraham in 2019 had a, had a very ambitious method for protein structure prediction. Um, there's another paper which, which talks about it more in the context of control. And then we're starting to see some software packages specifically come out for this type of work. So JAX-MD, which is an extension to JAX, uh, TorchMD, which is an extension to PyTorch, and then um, kind of other other frameworks more towards differentiable physics and, 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 uh, and, and imaging. So, uh, and then more broadly, of course, there are many machine learning approaches used to parameterize force fields. So there has been work done, but I mean, uh, it's still very much early days. So uh, before I came here at UCO, I did, I did this work um, to learn a coarse grain potential. So I'm just gonna briefly describe that. Uh, you can read more about it in this paper. Uh, basically each, each residue in the protein has four atoms and, um, then there's a relatively standard series of potentials, so bond potential, angle, torsion, and generic distance potential. We train on a set of about 2,000 proteins. Um, and at each epoch, we run simulation for each protein of up to 2,000 steps, starting from the native structure with a fairly high starting velocity. And then the idea is that the model has to learn the force field, which, um, which keeps the, the native structure stable. And indeed, what we find is that our potential, um, which is that they all start flat, so they match qualitatively the uh, potential for mean force you would find from the, from the protein data bank. Um, so, for instance, the, the distance between a, an isoleucine side chain and a leucine side chain, um, you can see follows the, the kind of the classic double, double potential uh, indicative of hydrophobic interactions. And um, uh, you can see on the right that the glycine interaction G is, is basically flat because glycine doesn't really have a, a side chain. So when you run this, uh, this learn potential forwards um, in, in kind of inference mode, uh, you see it can fold a uh, helical peptide over, over a few million steps, which is what you expect. Um, and then looking further at protein folding, you can start some, some small standard proteins from um, uh, kind of extended conformations with, with helices where there are predicted helices uh, just to speed up the simulation. And we find that, that our set of proteins fold to a native-like structure. Um, and the representative structures you get are kind of comparable in accuracy to unres and cabs fold, which are two existing uh, coarse grain folding methods. And you could, you could attempt to fold larger proteins uh, using replica exchange MD and the like. Okay, but really the next step and what I'm looking to do in the next few years is to apply this to uh, all atom force fields. Now there's been a lot of work improving parameters um, to describe disorder proteins and, and aggregation of proteins. Um, you know, even in the, last, in the last five years, there's been a series of, of new force fields that have come out to, to kind of correct some of the existing deficiencies. But that said, there are some challenges on the way. Um, 
don't know, first I'll talk about the loss function. So I think the attractive thing here is, is the variety of loss functions you can target. So um, our current force fields are deficient in a number of ways, but using this differentiable scheme, you can target the radius of gyration. So that's how compact um, a protein is. Um, you can target interactions. You can target a radial distribution function. You might know that some parts of the protein are flexible um, or you know, target uh, protein ligand binding for virtual screening, phase changes, um, things like amyloid aggregation. And then we're seeing you know, an explosion of cryo-EM data, for instance, that you can use to, to try and fit as well. But that said, um, there are some, some issues with differential simulation, so I'll just briefly go over those. Um, the, one of the big ones is GPU memory requirements. So when you're training, you need to store, store the values for your reverse mode AD. Um, and that means that the memory required scales with the number of steps, um, which is a problem if you want to run you know, millions of steps. Uh, although I should note that's not a problem when you're running the simulation in inference. Um, it's only when you're training. Uh, this, this though is a big issue in, in neural networks. So there is quite a large body of work um, kind of addressing it. So you can use forward mode automatic differentiation. Uh, you can use gradient checkpointing, um, or you can use kind of new, new algorithms uh, where you invert the simulation and, and don't record intermediate values. So, you know, talking about forward mode AD, it's probably worth just highlighting three different ways you can calculate these gradients over long simulations. Uh, the most standard way, I think, because it's used in neural networks is reverse mode AD. So you record the computation graph as you, as you go through the simulation and you compute the chain rule backwards. And the main advantage there is that your compute time is independent of the number of parameters, which is why it's used to train neural networks that typically have millions of parameters. But the, the memory required, as I mentioned, scales with, with model depth. The alternative is forward mode AD, uh, where you compute the chain rule forwards, and that kind of switches the advantages and disadvantages. Um, and then there is a, another way which comes more from um, kind of engineering control theory, uh, which is called the adjoint sensitivity, where you solve an augmented differential equation of the adjoint back in time. And that has the potential to solve, um, solve the disadvantages of the previous two methods. Uh, but there is very much limited implementations and guidance, particularly when it comes to scientific type models. Another issue is exploding gradients. So when you do AD, you, you get exact gradients, um, well, you, exact gradients to floating point error, but they're exact with respect to the numerical integration. And of course, the numerical integration is, is just an approximation of the actual dynamics. Um, so some functional force fields, for instance, the hard sphere interaction, are going to give exploding gradients. Um, and so there is, you know, there's kind of questions that I think are going to have to be addressed um, here about which integrators are suitable to take gradients through. Um, could you use a more conservative time step, for instance? And then specifically with regards to biomolecular simulation, um, there's a whole host of algorithms we use in our in our standard simulations, um, which aren't necessarily differentiable. For instance, long range electrostatics with with particle mesh yield or other yield summation approaches, uh, they're pretty hard to implement, let alone make them differentiable. So currently we just use the reaction field approximation. Bond and angle constraints, so that's where you, you don't just have a harmonic potential on bonds, you actually keep them fixed in the integration. Um, stochastic simulation, so that can actually provide benefits or drawbacks, um, but certain integrators, for instance, Langevin dynamics would use uh, stochastic uh, Stochasticity is part of their part of the simulation, and so, some aspects are okay. For instance, neighbor lists, um, where you, you find nearby atoms, those actually don't don't have to be differentiable because the, the output of a neighbor list is just is just a binary series of pairs, so the gradient would be zero. So I mentioned briefly, there's there's JAXMD, which which is nice um, to, to do these kind of simulations, but doesn't really have any protein support. Um, there's TorchMD, which, which does have protein support, but I think it's, it's fundamentally limited in its speed because of the way, the way PyTorch is implemented. And then there's Tai Chi and a few other approaches in the, in the wider kind of differential physics ecosystem. Uh, so these are all promising, but they're limited in some way. So I've developed a package in Julia called, called Molly, a proof of concept molecular dynamics. 
and uh, and GMS. Um, so Julia is a nice little programming language. I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, you might want to check it out if you do scientific computing. So so Molly is a pure Julia implementation of MD GMS. Um, and one of the philosophies is that user defined potentials for simulators should be easy and as fast as the built in versions. Uh, so currently, where is it? Well, you can simulate standard proteins um, and the trajectories match open and exactly, which is an existing fairly mature package. And um, you can calculate the gradients through the simulation with, with Zygot, which is a Julia AD package, and they match finite differencing um, for reverse and forward mode AD. The main drawback at the minute is the speed, so code runs much, much slower than widely used MD software due to the technical, technical requirements of differentiability and also due to the uh, very, very heavy optimization of existing software. So this is under active development. It's not stable or fully covered by tests, but every, every uh, week we're, we're adding new features. So to give you an idea of uh, running, running DMS on small proteins, um, if you ran uh, Alinga peptide, which is two residue peptide in, uh, in water, which is about 3,000 atoms. Um, it takes about 200 milliseconds per step, but we're you know, constantly working on ways to, to make that faster, and we have some ideas. Um, if you look at uh, implicit solvent, which I'll describe in a minute, you can, uh, you can, you can go much faster. And a, 15, a 15 residue peptide um, is about 50 milliseconds per step. And just on the right, there are some examples of gradients you get out so for instance the one on the top means that um, the, the gradient of the of the RMSD to the starting structure uh, with respect to that parameter sigma on n is positive which means that as you increase that that parameter and um, the RMSD increases and you can get that kind of gradient for, for all the for all the parameters in your system including some um, slightly weird ones like you know temperature time step kind of kind of strange things you might not necessarily expect to um, and we use a Longevin integrator, um, which basically adds a, a noise term and a friction term. I, I won't go into the details, but I expect many of you have heard of it. Uh, and we actually find that's, that's really useful because it prevents gradient explosion um, because I, I, th I think it's something to do with the, the constant stochasticity effectively damps down the gradients, which is quite nice. It prevents them exploding. Uh, and we also add some gradient norm clipping just to just uh, stop it exploding. So the gradients actually are pretty well behaved over a million steps, which will be a very, very, very lot, uh, deep neural network. Um, and so, you know, the question then arises, can, can we see useful loss functions on the nanosecond scale and start to train things? So uh, we decided to look at implicit solvent force, force fields. So most of the, the atoms in a biomolecular system, that when you simulate them are solvent, um, we're actually largely interested in the solutes. So implicit solvent, Places the solvent molecules with a continuous medium. It's kind of a hack. It benefits a lot from kind of cancellation of errors. And um, there are some problems with implicit solvent, like proteins tend to overcompact. So they're not really suitable for studying disorder proteins, um, which is a shame because disorder proteins would typically need a big solvent box. So we'd like to use these, these methods. Um, and it's also not suited for studying protein aggregation, which again is a shame because if you're studying something like amyloid aggregates, um, you would require a huge water box. So these are potentially very useful methods. So we aim to learn a better force field. So we train on seven small proteins. Um, I won't go into the details right now, but we target similarity to the native structure for some of them, which are globular, as in folded, and we target the correct degree of compactness for the disorder proteins. Uh, and because we're, we want to improve an existing force field, we, we kind of fine tune from starting from uh, an existing candidate. Um, and in fact, what we find is quite, you know, within just two epochs of training, um, so that's two one, one nanosecond simulations on the seven proteins, uh, allowing just a maximum 2% change with each parameter. So this really is fine tuning. We find that we can actually improve uh, the force field. So Looking at tryptophan cage, which is a globular protein, uh, we find it has a similar RMSD um, to the native when you simulate it in the new force field. So the dotted lines here represent the, the average. Um, however, when you simulate uh, histatin 5, which is a, a small disorder protein, you see that the radius of gyration has improved, uh, has increased, which is the direction you'd want it to go. 
Uh, in fact, you would want it to go even higher than this. So current work is basically uh, trying to improve the, the performance on disordered proteins, whilst not degrade the performance on folded proteins. So in conclusion, um, differential molecular simulation is, is a very general approach to learning the parameters of force fields. Um, it's really enabled by recent advances in hardware, in software, and the huge explosion we're seeing in biological data. Um, in previous work, we, we showed that a coarse grained force field was learned that matches uh, protein data bank statistics and can fold small proteins. And now current work is looking at implicit solvents force fields and how they can work on a wider variety of systems. And I think overall that the guiding point here is can we keep the deep learning revolution interpretable? You know, it's all well and good training massive neural networks. But what we want is interpretable physical models that, that we can run. So thanks to this, your sharers group at MRC LMB um, and the Structural Studies Division more widely, uh, and also to David Jones' group at UCL, where I, where I started this work. And thank you for your attention.